So a little while ago I was up at the B-Lab, awesome place. Uh, we actually, I actually got permission to record the conversations we had, but you know, it's kind of awkward recording people while you're talking to them. So I just had Canyon kind of hold the camera while it was recording so we could get audio. So most of it was kind of pointing at the ground or the ceiling. So it's not really that fun to watch. And I was thinking of making the audio and uh, maybe taking the audio and putting it to a slideshow of pictures or something. But honestly, the audio wasn't that good either. I will add some clips of some highlights uh, after this little spill here. And of course, my official introduction. <laughs> so you can look forward to that. Uh, go ahead and watch it. Although, I will tell you right now what we discovered. So we'll talk to them. We, we talked mostly about uh, the possibility of putting bees in space and they're, they're super excited about it. Uh, we might actually be putting a team together, getting some people from the astronomy. Uh, that one thing, we study bugs. Uh, they got a club here in town. Uh, the bee lab and a couple of commercial bee growers and other people. We might actually put a team together and see if we can start breeding some bees for use in space and specifically small greenhouses which are isolated. We're thinking of maybe starting off like inside of a tunnel or no, initially we'd just do wood greenhouses like we're doing. But eventually we'd like to be able to inside of a tunnel, underground, artificial lighting, artificial everything basically, and see if we can get bees that can handle it. And if we can get that to work, then we could have some bees ready when people start going into space. So we talked about this uh, quite a bit and you know, bees are really important. We gotta have some pollinators because you know, going around, can you imagine going around to each flower and touching it with a Q-tip multiple times a day in order to get pollination? Uh, you'd have to have an army of people to do that. And in space, with just a few astronauts, that's not really going to be happening. So, bees are something we're definitely excited about doing. Like, even if for a terrestrial use for a completely artificial underground facility, be could be quite useful. So it could be quite lucrative for us to produce some bees that are in space. And also the USU people are really excited because, uh, you know, you know, we're known for our spider goats. You know, they're uh, uh, goats that they've inserted spider genes into to make spider silk. Well, why couldn't we be known for space bees? <laughs> so that'd be cool. Uh, we, we talked about uh, the type of bees that we'd need. And we actually figured that uh, regular bumblebees might be a best place to start because they're already being bred for greenhouse use. The uh, blue orchard bees, or mason bees, which I was talking about in an earlier episode, in fact, I think my last beekeeping episode, uh, those have been used inside greenhouses. And I think I have a clip of us inside the greenhouse where they have the orchard bees. But the problem is, is they have to have a tent over the bees, over the flowers, because the, even the orchard bees want to fly away from the nest and bang themselves against the glass until they die. But uh, putting the tent over them does help because it obstructs their view. And uh, I think he said once that uh, frosted glass might do the trick, but of course the greenhouses are clear, so there's that. But I think the biggest problem that we have with them is the fact that you can't feed them artificially. They want to go to actual flowers, so they're out just right there. Bumblebees, on the other hand, you can put a feeder inside the hive and they're okay. So there's that. Uh, we talked about the possibility of taking uh, honeybees and possibly breeding them down so they'd be in a smaller space and a smaller hive. But again, that's going to take a lot of successive generations and a lot of work, and it's going to be a huge project. Sure, it'd be worth it, but uh, you know, we kind of want to have some results fairly quickly. Uh, one of the bigger things that they said is perhaps we could use a more solitary bee, like the leafcutter bee. Uh, they, they've been studying that one and they think that would actually work because it can live in a small area. Uh, it actually eats anything. It's very good at adapting to unusual environments. It's actually an invasive species, so that'd be very good as well. You know, you know we're, we're going to be... I'm going to go talk to Corey Stanley soon. I got his contact information. He wasn't actually there. He was out collecting bees. You know, awesome. You know, we're, we're, it's an ongoing project. We'll talk about this to many people, put a team together, like I said, and uh, hopefully eventually we'll have space bees. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's kind of cool that uh, I'm in on this project. And I really hope it works out. So, I uh, hope you guys enjoy the next couple of clips. Super short, not very high quality. You know, mostly to prove that I was there and we looked at things. I think I inserted some pictures with the uh, information about the blue orchard bees. So, 
uh, go ahead and watch that if you like. If not, I guess I'll see you next time. All right, everyone, Cody here. So I'm here at the USU Bee Lab, as you can see. Uh, this is actually one of the best places in the state for studying bees. And it's uh, really quite amazing I haven't been up here yet. So we're gonna actually go inside and have a look around. You know, see if we can talk to someone. Is that good? <laughs> Okay. Okay. I see. Yes. Yeah. In fact, if, all right. So we might as well start the grand tour here. <laughs> so I'm like. Would you mind if we uh, recorded some of it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can go ahead and record them. So, dang it, Amy's out here. I don't know quite where um, Corey is, but pretty much what I do is I look at how to raise bumblebees. Oh, well, that's what my life depends. And Blooming within here. Actually, so we have quite a few different species here. And these actually came in. Oh, they're actually alive in here. Oh yes. Wow. No, 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 no. We're not. We're not like the people up at the, <laughs> at the lab. So this is. Uh, this that looks is, like a queen. It is. So everything that comes out right now is a queen because unlike yeah. honeybees, bumblebees have a annual life cycle and whatnot, aside from a perennial one. Right. So yeah. So what we do is you know, we go around here and pretty much what we've been catching them on is facelia, but also any early blooming. Um, so, you're plants, just, so you're just going and catching the queens. Catching them. When we throw them in here, what we do is we give them wax put on the. Uh, a wax coated pollen provision and a free one. And okay. from what we've seen so far, so like if you were to put on like a pollen trap onto your hive and just let it sit for a couple days, um, we take that, we grind it up, and then we add just a little bit of a sucral solution just to kind of get sticky. And then we give them that. And what they use that for is to then just build their hive on that. So that's, oh, this was collected on. I want to say last Thursday, Friday. So this is actually from uh, Southern Oregon. And these here are from the Seattle area. And they can actually take off pretty well. So this is oh, one. She's actually got yeah, her so nest going. Just, these are probably a month out. Um, different types of species kind of build up differently. Um, the ones that we raise primarily here are Huntii and Oxymentalis, and they build up pretty, pretty large colonies. Um, but that's what we do here right now, and we keep moving on. Uh, the reason why we're raising them, aside from trying to uh, replenish the number of bees that are within the area, we're also doing biology, and we're building a large part, we're looking at the genetics too. Difference, um, because Honeybees, you know, they can multiple be made. Right. A lot of people, when they um, do artificial insemination, they want to do that to have a high genetic diversity within a hive so that, you know, they don't get sick and whatnot. Um, so that's one of the other students here. John, who actually collected quite a few of those bumblebees, that's what he looks into, is uh, hive. Oh, oh look. we have some, some interesting people, a local yeah. beekeeper. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually been looking into pollinating for greenhouses too. So. Mm. The thing is, though, oh, we need more. The thing is that honey bees don't. No, they don't. <laughs> so I've tried. So this is um. So this is what we're currently doing—a little trial here. So on this day, we have a few different varieties, and in fact, blueberries. We're pretty much kind of looking at the same thing. So here is the end result. So you'll have a queen and you'll have so many daughter workers and whatnot. Um, and then she'll you have... clipped her wing? Oh no, that they do that by themselves. Oh. Yes. Well the thing is just the whole, um, it's how you raise them. They do take a little bit, oh, it's okay. As long as you, just as long as we're not tapping on it. And then here we actually have a queenless hive. Can they make their own queen? They cannot. So, so unlike any of these. No. That, okay, so that is the one thing I'm wondering about, because, you know, I'm trying to get into it. So like when, when a hive re itself, does it then use its own drums to fertilize it? Or uh, you want them not to. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, but she would go and made on the um, pretty much. Uh, if they use their own drones, it ends up with a very spotty root pad. Okay. I, I have seen that happen. Okay. Uh, um, but yeah, so just to let you know that there are pretty much only two... Okay. There are pretty much only two uh, commercial 
suppliers of bumblebees and that those be targeted against for a great amount of small damage. Right. And then here they're spread in front of some of So there were, there are Pretty much this was a little uh, before and after that we're taking a look at. And that was the control. And they are pretty much about the same size, but a lot of them did not return. So, so the fungicides wiped them out, huh? Is that what they're it's not so much for? we're taking a look to see whether or not they keep going to the plants. Okay. Because what's the point of having something in a greenhouse that you can pay for and it's not even gonna go and pollinate? Right. But, yeah, so bumblebees are a big, big commodity for a greenhouse pollination as you probably find out. Um, but yeah, so what have you guys been thinking about? I was actually looking into doing space space. Oh, what? Yeah. Because I'm with uh, Mars One, and we're going to be putting <gasps> no, people no, on no, Mars, no, and we need to be able to okay. pollinate the small greenhouse. Oh, okay. My, uh, so my girlfriend, she uh, so teaches, happens, so she's part of a big collaboration yeah, over at CU Boulder, uh, and she does robotics, and one of the things that they do, like, they do different modules for everything. And one of them was in space, and how can you develop a robot that's in space? And I kind of was wondering about that, about how do bees determine how you're going to be growing your own food in space. <laughs> you need something to pollinate it. You know, the person, you could do it, but you know how bees are situated. Sure, I'm wondering though if they would resort more to crawling than so flying because. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, well, on Mars. On oh, Mars, oh, there would be some gravity. So it's in a green, yeah. so it would, so it would still have. Yeah, that. maybe we do the zero gravity bees as well. Like the best. Well, yeah. But then again, that that the whole. I mean, NASA did send honeybees into space, and they were looking at how they built their comb and stuff, but they never let them fly. Right? I'd really love to see them fly. Oh, they, so they kept them out of the flying space. Yeah, I'd love to see the bees fly. I imagine they figure it out because they're pretty smart. Okay, sorry. When you talked about referencing that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's she, pretty crazy. She would be the one to talk to as far as because um, I can tell you right now. Certain species we've tried to do in the greenhouse, and they just they don't work. They just don't work. But who knows? And also, I was thinking if we could like get well, the team together and like actually try to selectively breed them for like a confined greenhouse environment. What is this for? Is this just? It's just a. Uh, Oh, cool. The potential for it is like it's basically like there. Are, despite the fact that this is an enclosed space, there's little holes everywhere, and different. And they'll, I mean, they'll they'll try until they are dead to find a way, a way to get out. And what the tent does for us is that uh, there are no holes in it whatsoever, so they have to stay in there. And so they'll, usually, when you release them. One of the things we don't know about solitary bees is what they do between the time that you release them and when they start nesting. And for the most part, like our, our osmia, we have maybe a 30% retention rate. And a lot of them just disappear and we never see them again. And then the remaining ones nest. So the tent is kind of like forced them all to stay here. And then we get a little higher, higher success rate. But the competition has to need enough in the tent, enough more resources for them to actually establish a population and multiply the population. So, can you feed them supplemental sources? Uh, unfortunately, not. Not the uh, Osmia is an area that the world should be. Uh, they won't go to supplemental feeders. They've tried. I don't know about, say, we. So, like Houston was saying, leaf cutting bees might be a better option for that sort of thing. They're, uh, they're bees, it's called Mega Kylie Rose and Data. They're from uh, Europe and they've been introduced here. And they're kind of an invasive species, but we use them for alfalfa pollination. Uh, they're much less particular than a lot of the, the native bees. And I think that's a, that's kind of a trait of all. You know, I wouldn't mind using an invasive species as long as we do it. Right? Yeah, and I mean everything's going to be invasive. On Mars. Actually, you want invasive species because those are the ones that are able to adapt to different. Yeah, parts. and really that's what we're, we've been talking about. So yeah, that probably would be a better uh, option if you were to try uh, a solitary bee, and that's something that we have. I mean, we use them for uh, alfalfa pollination, and so. They are basically our, our largest or our single uh, most important solidarity pollinator. 